Hi YouTube and welcome to another episode, episode four of the Hitman Hideout podcast, a podcast that focuses on obviously the Hitman franchise um, and also the community online that uh, gather together in their shared passion for the Agent 47 franchise. Um, this podcast isn't just about discussing the Hitman games, it's also about bringing different members of the community together and collaborating and sharing various talents. And uh, yeah, um, that's exactly what we're doing this episode as we have done the past few episodes. Um, obviously, I'm here with my usual co-host, uh, Timothy Mark, and uh, we have a very special guest joining us this episode uh he is filling in our, our f very first role as a guest co-host and uh he is a member of the hitman community that i've personally known for some time um and uh yeah i really wanted to bring him on because he's uh very very knowledgeable on the topic of this episode which is obviously talking about the story of the world of assassination trilogy and uh, he goes by the name of xavier dj um perfect person to have on the podcast for this episode because obviously yeah he is a huge fan of the law very knowledgeable on the topic um so yeah welcome xavier thank you for coming on man xavier oh thank you for having me guys thank you so much it's a pleasure to be here yeah no no problem at all dude um have you? yeah did you want to add anything tim before we start things off no i'll, I'll just say yeah thanks for coming on um I think the lore and the narrative is something I'm I'm less versed in, so it's a perfect opportunity to have a, the, our first guest co-host on, which I think we'd say is different to the to a guest um, which we'd interview in a sort of more personal way. I yeah. think Xavier is here as um, a host with us today, so he's yeah. actually going to yeah contribute yeah. more to the discussion. You'll see what we mean. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. obviously we're not about just having prominent figures from the hitman community on we're also about having anybody that's a part of the community um so if you're if you happen to be knowledgeable on a given topic like xavier is with the story um please feel free to make yourself known in the guest pool channel uh text channel on the uh, all things hitman discord because we'd love to hear from you and uh yeah you can pitch yourself there if you're interested in coming on uh, as a guest host and uh, obviously we can't promise to have everyone on but we'll do our best to get as many people on as possible um, and yeah, it's not just for sure we're genuinely interested in finding uh even if you yeah you, have, you, have, you don't have to have a youtube channel or twitch you don't have, to have any of the sort of like public facing things we're just interested in people to talk to so it's not yeah. just for show or to make it seem like we're interested in the community we are genuinely interested in having yeah, really interesting um, perspectives and voices on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. precisely. Um, so for this episode, we mostly want to focus on the overarching story and discuss the main characters, the pros and cons, and kind of break down the narrative in a way and talk about what we did like, what we didn't like, now that we know the whole story, finally, after yeah. waiting patiently for five or, five or so years. Um, we also want to not just discuss the overarching story, we want to touch on the sandbox story as well. So, for example, mission stories and just NPC dialogue that occurs um, in-game and kind of compare the two. Um, but before we get into all that, uh, let's hear a little bit from Xavier. So, firstly, where are you, where are you from, man? I am from... Uh st pete or tampa florida i was born and raised in miami florida so i'm in a very tropical climate and of course the famous miami level uh yeah. from hitman oh. 2 yeah and w <laughs> which i can actually honestly say from somebody who was born in miami they hit it spot on like that's so cool that's obviously so awesome. it's, it's a fictional variation of what miami would look like but when i played it i was like i feel like i'm back home it, it feels almost exactly how you would feel with all the colors and that whole Miami wow. Vice type of feel, they they really do a, a great job in researching their locations. So yeah. IO Interactive nailed it out of the park. That's wow. so but cool, um, man. yeah, I mean, I've, I've been a Hitman fan for a very long time. And I love all the games. I did take a little bit of a hiatus there during the Absolution era. No offense to Absolution, but um, I did. I just kind of you know life got in the way, and I that's the only game I haven't actually played. 
Oh, well, till, till this day, I still haven't played it. <laughs> oh. But um, but it's okay. Like I know, yeah. I know the gist of it, and yeah. you know, it's we should be fine with the lore. It didn't really yeah. have too crucial of an impact with with this trilogy. Yeah, no, it's no. very rarely brought up in the new trilogy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, sorry, just before we hear about how you got into Hitman, um, I just want to quickly go back to that fact that you just shared with us about, um, one of the, well, I, personally, I think Miami is the best Hitman 2 level. Uh, I think that's, um, a pretty universal consensus amongst Hitman fans. Um, and the fact that like you're from Miami, I can't imagine what it would be like to actually play a hitman level yeah. set in your hometown like <laughs> that'll be so awesome <laughs> it, it was absolutely mind-blowing when i found out that they're doing miami i was so blown away yeah because i knew that they were going to capture obviously the the main essence of it which which they did perfectly yeah <laughs> Was it your? I'm a bit jealous. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Iyer has never come to Australia at the Hitman franchise, yeah. so yeah. with the exception of a fake Australia in the tutorial mission, yeah. but it doesn't count. Uh, and if he, yeah, I, I would love that. Actually, that would be amazing if they did Australia one day. So yeah, it'd be in the so outback good. or something like uh, probably stereotypical probably in the like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, that, that's really cool, dude. Um, is it your favorite level for that reason? And Hitman Two, actually, oh, oh man, that's a tough question. Because it's your hometown. <laughs> I love Miami; like, it has a has a special place in my heart. But no, it is is it actually not uh, my favorite level or favorite location in the Hitman trilogy. I think that's a really tough question. But at least in Part Two, I think um, the bank kind of won me over. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it's a good choice, it, though. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was just it was kind of like an unexpected surprise because obviously it was one of the DLC maps, and I was just so uh, like impressed by a DLC location, just having so much uh, little story details and, and just little intricacies. It was just a fun location. It felt very old school type of a layout too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I I just I love the bank, but of course Miami is the Paris of Hitman Two for sure. Yeah, I agree with that. Hundred percent. Um, or uh, Paris or Sampienza, I guess. So. Yeah, it's yeah. Different kind of, people can. It's usually the debate. Yeah, Paris or Sampienza, which is the best. Well, some people say Hokkaido as well. So yeah, yeah Hokkaido's up, up there the too. They're yeah. definitely the three stronger maps. Of, yeah, of the legacy mm -hmm. maps. Yeah. Um, so Xavier, you said that you have been a long time Hitman fan, and you had a bit of a gap from the friend or a bit of a hiatus from the ser series during the absolute absolution era sorry that's a significant break because we had blood money in 06 and then yeah so it's, it's 10 years Absolutely. so that is a long break um so how did you first get into hitman what was the first what drew firstly what was what was your first hitman game and and what was it about that game or well it must have been that first game that you played that kind of drew you drew you into the series yeah, it was actually uh, Hitman Contracts. Um, that was the first game I ever got introduced to Agent 47 and the ICA and everything. And uh, it just came out of pure uh, uh, just curiosity. Because at the time, uh, I'm not sure if this is very internationally known, but there's a, co a company in the United States called Gamefly that is kind of like what Netflix used to be where you would subscribe and then they would mail you out the DVDs so you could watch the movies and then mail them back Ooh, to them. Oh, kind of like renting it through the mail service. And uh, Gamefly was doing the same thing, but with video games. And at that time, I think it was like PS2 and GameCube and stuff like that. So um, I ordered Hitman contracts to rent because I was waiting for another game to be available. And I was like, hey, that looks pretty cool. I've, I've seen, you know, the bald man with the barcode behind his head a few times in commercials or on TV. Let me check it out. And I fell in love with the game. I fell in love with uh, the concept, um, it being a stealth game. But I, I immediately uh, just kind of, no, this is definitely a, a game to test your mind. To, it's a puzzle game in, mm -hmm. in all actuality. At least that's the way I felt it with, with contracts. And... I just fell in love with it. The everything, everything about Agent Forty Seven, the story, uh, and of course, Contracts was pretty. Uh, it, I think it's a great game to kind of get into the series, at least at that time, because it kind of took like the best of what came before, and they kind of like uh, 
remastered it in a way. Um, and then after that, that's when I backtracked and I played um, Hitman, uh, Silent Assa- uh, yes, Hitman 2, Silent Assassin. And then eventually I played, uh, never beat it, but I played uh, Codename 47 on PC. But just because I was like, oh, man, I got to play more of this. Like, what came before this? And and I've just been hooked ever since. So every ever since that, I've just been a huge fan of the series. And uh, I just love the the fact that with Hitman, because I've heard a lot of this lately, that a lot of people say, oh, you know, nobody really plays Hitman for the story. But in all actuality, I loved um, exploring for hours upon hours and just catching these little bits and pieces of dialogue that really made me realize that the story is actually pretty rich and it's it's kind of like hidden and the more time you invest in these games the more it will reward you with bits and pieces mm-hmm. of dialogue that kind of add to the story arc yeah absolutely and that's what i love about hitman yeah yeah so um in relation to cuz you said you played contracts first um did you, when you went back and played the older games, did you, especially Codem 47, did it recontextualize contracts in your mind? Because when I played contracts, because I played the games in order, um, Codem 47 to contracts. When I played contracts, um, playing the old levels, it really felt like a fever dream in the lore of the, um, of the game because um, 47 was obviously pretty much dying in, that, in contracts and him misremembering the old levels is sort of a worse version of what they were. Did that um, did playing contracts first recontextualize the old levels when you played them um, in, in Code Name Forty Seven? Uh, it it did because I didn't realize that until after the fact, um, after replaying everything. Mm. So it it kind of made it seem like when I was playing contracts, I was like, oh, so this actually is the the actual proper recollection of it. But yeah, no, it added more depth to what Forty Seven was actually going through in that particular game with his memories and recollections of previous missions and replaying um or playing codename 47 after it kind of at first i was just like oh maybe it's just you know they just made the the levels better or the story they just kind of tweaked a little bit just to kind of make it a little bit more entertaining for contracts but uh no it's 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 perfectly valid with the fact that uh you know, Codename 47 is so impactful to Agent 47 and, and his career moving forward with the ICA, obviously uh, taking out all of the DNA donors for, for uh, his uh, genetics. So it's it's very, very uh, deep diving, I guess you should say, in, in a way to kind of work backwards. But it was still absolutely fun. I, I had a blast kind of like catching up with everything and preparing for blood money. Of course, after that. Hmm. Yeah. It's a very interesting way to experience the games, yeah. Yeah. And I really <laughs> like backwards. I really like the fact that like the story of um Blood Money kinda interwove with contracts. Um, like the the mission in Blood Money, the Opera House mission, curtains down, um, that's set in Paris. And that actually like the whole time in contracts where forty seven slipping in and out of consciousness in that like dingy hotel room that's in Paris as well and that's actually contracts actually occurs after I don't know if you remember there's a cut scene in Blood Money after Curtains Down where someone like um they he's the cock police a, officer who like cocks his yeah gun. cocks yeah. his pistol and <clears throat> walks after 47 down yeah. this quiet rain swept like Parisian street boulevard and then shoots him we don't see it that's an off screen event but 47's obviously quite, he's maimed by the bullet and make, manages to escape and make it back to the hotel. But yeah, I just think that's great storytelling, the way they... It's amazing, especially in, like in the first four games, you can play them in any order and then events will be recontextualized and still work if you play like later games or early games first. So yeah. I think it's really impressive storytelling yeah. in the first four games. Yeah, Because it all works out of order. Yeah, it and does. in yeah. order as well, yeah. And I think, Xavier, it's cool that your first introduction to Hitman was Contracts because from a storytelling perspective, the thing I love about Contracts is that there's no overarching story, It's just which is totally unique of any other game in the franchise. 
And uh, that just yeah. would have been such a cool way to kind of first experience a Hitman game because I just you don't always need an overarching story. Um, contracts proves that. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I just love the fact that there's not really any connecting narrative. It's every map's just its own standalone little episode in 47's career or little snapshot into his career. And uh, I think that's a concept I'd really like to see IO explore more in the future. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, I think that... I think eventually, um, hopefully, in the in the near future, we should, as the fan base, could quite possibly get like a remastered uh, interpretation, kind of like how we got with the homage cinematic in, in Hitman 2016, mm. where it kind of shows all his iconic previous canon kills. Mm. I really, when I saw that, it just, oh man, I wish I could just go back to these locations and just replay them with the graphics of today or uh, yeah. the engine on today's. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that would be so fascinating. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be the only way you could really do like mission DLC, I think, in the new, in the new game. Um, oh, yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. Starting a new yeah. plotline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was like a little taste of it, of what could be. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and that was. That was the opening cinematic, uh, and they released that as a trailer just prior to yeah, release. Legacy, I think. Legacy cinematic. Or yeah, yeah. That's the best cinematic was, in the game. I still, honestly, it's so yeah, good. So yeah, so good. And I love the Shadow Clients narration in that too. Um, Absolutely. And I think that's a good segue into the main overarching story of the World of Assassination trilogy, which is um, obviously a focal point of this episode. Um, so I thought we'd offer a quick recap of the overarching narrative um, for anyone that might not be familiar. Um, so I won't, I'll try to keep it brief. I'll try not to, just let me know if I'm going into too much detail. But essentially it's set a fair few years after Absolution or arguably in a parallel universe. Io hasn't really made that clear. Um <laughs> It's almost like they wrote off <laughs> Absolution. Um, I think it starts in 2019. I assume yeah. Absolution was set roughly when, like 2012. Yeah, I, I think, think it, it was. Yeah. I think it was. I think it did start in 2019. Yeah. And I think, doesn't it end in 2021? I'm fairly certain. I think so. I think it yeah. occurs over a, two, a span of two years, roughly. Yeah. Um, but there's a. Yeah, that was actually quite confusing um because obviously we got the first installment in 2016 so mm-hmm. for some reason in my mind for the longest time i thought we were going off of that timeline but yeah. it makes more sense that they moved the years a little bit more uh forthcoming yeah i guess they were planning to like end in the year you play the last game and then maybe just i don't know i guess because the plot was starting it was more condensed they were like let's just push it forward a couple of years <laughs> yeah 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 so basically in the in the first in Hitman twenty sixteen or Hitman one, um, you've got forty seven he's just working for the ICA as normal. Um and that that entry's kinda like the exposition. It sets up the character introduces people to new characters, introduces the player base to the general conception of what the story is going to be out. It kind of just set, it's like the, it, it sets all the pieces in place. And then Hitman two and Hitman three is where the real kind of narrative arc um really s- starts to chessboard yeah like a chessboard <laughs> um yeah. so in hitman one you've got 47 who's still working with diana as his handler for ica um out of nowhere this mysterious shadow client appears that we later obviously learn is lucas gray he starts manipulating ica to uh sabotage and wage war against this cable or cabal. I'm not sure how you pronounce that word. I think cabal. Cabal, sure. <laughs> like a secret society, yeah. like the Illuminati known as Providence, which is obviously headed by the Constant, also known as Arthur Edwards. And Lucas Gray kind of formulates this this private militia and, uh, manip- and at the same time manipulates ICA to... to kill these high profile t- operatives within providence and uh we later learned that the whole reason lucas gray is doing this is because he was in fact subject six a clone brother of 47 
way back in the asylum, in Ortmeier's asylum in Romania. And when they were young, they obviously had a very traumatic and institutionalized upbringing. They were forced to kill from a very young age and that kind of screwed them up and they made this blood pact to bring down Providence one day and, and seek revenge. And then 47 and Lucas Gray tried to escape the asylum so that they could enact their revenge. Gray escaped and then just went into hiding. And then 47 obviously was captured and then they wiped his memory with some magic <laughs> um, yeah, <pretty> much. <laughs> injection on, of some kind. And then it wasn't until that he, he meets Lucas Gray many years later during the events of Hitman 2 uh, at, at the asylum itself. They track him, ICA track him down. And, and that's when uh, Diana and 47 stop working for Providence and they shift sides and agree to help Lucas Gray take down Providence. And then obviously Gray sacrifices himself at, during the events of Hitman 3 to save 47 and Diana seemingly betrays 47 by joining Providence to become the new constant and then uh, it kind of ends with that formulaic ending what has now become a very formulaic ending of Diana seemingly betraying 47 but in reality she has never ever even though they threw in that plot twist of 47 killed Diana's parents um it kind of she's too she overcomes that obstacle in her own mind because she's too yeah, smart. Yeah. <laughs> she's too intelligent. Yeah. yeah. And her and 47 yeah. share too much history. Um and then it, they manage to kill Arthur Edwards and then 47 walks off into the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> That's the general gist of the story. Um so sorry if I raved on too long there with the recap, but um can I start with you, Xavier? Like, what what did you like about the, the overarching story, firstly? And then once you've shared your what you did like, what did you not like? Well, definitely, um, I love the relationship that they've developed with Lucas Gray and 847, or obviously uh, Subject 6 and Subject 47. And it just kind of added a lot of missing details that I believe that we've had. I know that they've mentioned this too in, in the uh, the graphic novels and stuff like that. Like there's been mentions of Subject Six in uh, the writing text of Hitman's Lore, but um, this was the first time that we actually saw it integrated into a video game. And so I loved Lucas Gray's character from the beginning, and I loved how they took the fans of the series on a, on a ride with each part. Like you had part one, which I feel was an introduction to the shadow client, but we, we really didn't know who he was. We didn't really know his backstory, his relationship to 847 yet at the time. And I just loved how they, it was a slow burn. I mean, you, you had an idea like who is, this is obviously somebody from 47's past, but who exactly is he? And, um, the fact that he was basically always aware of Agent 47 and his next move and how he was probably going to kill his target mm -hmm. that he was basically setting up for. He was basically handing these targets to Agent 47 knowing that he's going to accomplish his goal. But he's always kind of like just watching, just observing, mm -hmm. making sure that he's conducting his plan in essence. And I just love that because... He's obviously trained with him, grew up with him, so he knows like what to look for with Agent 47 and his MO. And um, I just found that absolutely fascinating through how it was kind of like a slow burn throughout all, all three parts. That's what I mm. loved about this trilogy. Mm. And also, it's it kind of sucks that, uh, obviously, you know, spoiler, if, if you're uh, watching this, you already know what's going on, but the demise of Lucas Gray was kind of, Ah, uh, like really, it was like a gut blow in part three. Yeah, <laughs> but we kind of we kind of saw that coming in a way. Like somebody yeah. was more than likely going to end up getting uh, knocked off here. But yeah, um, 
it was it's just such a dynamic relationship that I wish we could have seen uh, told a little bit longer. But in a way, we we got three games out of it. So yeah, uh, that's the one thing I really. Lo- I also loved to be fair. In this particular trilogy, we really got to see Forty Seven kind of more humanized. Um, Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I I feel like the story kind of helped d- develop that because obviously. Uh, we've known Agent 47 as like this emotionless character for so long because he's just been trained to kill, literally. That's all he knows how to do. And the relationship that he has with Diana has grown over the years. And in this trilogy, I, I, it was like a chef's kiss moment when we have that uh, uh, part in Argentina where he actually gets to, obviously as a cover, but he actually finally gets to dance with uh, Diana. It's just yeah. like, oh man, this is awesome because yeah. <laughs> it's such a human characteristic that you would have never thought Agent 47 would even be able to tango or just have no, a, no, a no. nice slow <laughs> dance yeah. with Diana. Yeah, that's so true. Um, so the character development, I, I thought they did wonderfully with uh, Diana and Agent 47. Obviously, you could tell that there's a lot of trust there between the two, even at the very end where you think there was a double cross. Um, but of course, for fans of Absolution and even games before that, like in Blood Bunny, we already know if Diane is doing something that seems like it's against 47, chances are nine times out of 10, it's just to help them and yeah. their their end result mission. So yeah. I kind of saw that coming yeah. from a mile away too, but it, it's, it's all in good fun. I feel like uh, with any type of spy espionage, you kind of, have to have those parts in there to kind of make you. Oh wait, is she really turning on us? And yeah, um, very. I, I really. <laughs> yeah, very. Yeah. Awesome. yeah, that's what I really loved about the game. And um, I guess something that I didn't really care for, uh, or a, a negative connotation towards it was, I feel like they could have put a little bit more emphasis on the Providence board members, because I feel like. We kind of there's there's a few board members that we see that uh, Arthur Edwards is talking to, or you know he's saying, "Oh, you know, watch your back because nobody's safe anymore." And then you're just like, "Well, whatever happened to them?" Because like I know in Colorado, uh, you can see the uh, the board that the that Lucas Gray had basically questioning, "Is this target worth it? Is this target worth it? This target we definitely need to take out." So I wish they would have put a little bit more emphasis on why Lucas Gray was uh, targeting specific board members. Because mm. in the end, I don't believe technically Agent 47 took out everyone in Providence. I think he just took out uh, most of the people that I guess had the more strength in the um, organization. Mm. And that's just one thing that that always kind of left me a little bit of uh curious as to why they mm. did it that way but i guess mm. in the end it's just to kind of make the story kind of run smoothly but um as far as lore wise i, I think th- they did a phenomenal job they really did a great job kind of intertwining the targets uh, i feel like each target in the game had a reason for them being there even if it could have been a very minuscule small part but it's a, a part that they played in a huge plan from Providence and also from Lucas Gray trying to take down Providence and ICE's connection towards it. So I think they did a really good job kind of just seamlessly uh, bringing us through the story that way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I agree with everything you say. <laughs> um, I think, <laughs> I think uh, your explanation of, yeah you i I applaud your summary because i think um you hit the nail on the head with everything you just described i like the way you use the metaphor of the slow burn um from from the get-go um i agree wholeheartedly with the with hitman one being the perfect setup like i i just think it was executed so flawlessly uh that that setup of those characters because at the end of hitman one like you have the cliffhanger in the train with diana and the constant meeting and and you know she looks at the photo of like the constant um convinces 
Diana to join Providence in the fight against the Shadow Client because um, he, Arthur Edwards can offer insight into 47's past and we have the photograph of an adolescent 47. Like, that was just such a good cliffhanger. Um, and I felt, I, I agree with you, I felt Lucas Grade's death was far too premature. Um, he was by far, I think, the most intriguing character of the entire story of, of, of a lot of hitman stories i think he's by far the most complex and interesting character and i think yeah they tried to kind of with his death they i don't want to talk about it too much because i'm currently making a video on it <laughs> but i'll just briefly say <laughs> that i i thought i thought his death was a bit cheap in that they were trying to get like some kind of tragic moment in the in the story um and they're like oh we can't kill off diana yeah that's it that's it um <laughs> yeah. it was kind of like this climactic moment but it didn't quite work and uh i just think it would have been so interesting to see these two characters 47 and and gray it would have been just been so interesting to see where they could have gone and the history that they share io could have done so many cool things with like exploring the history of those two characters and and as they and even moving forward uh to have gray as like a handler like a, as a, even a new handler if they decided to kill diana off or if he was even just i love the the trio thing happening i loved it when in missions like whittleton creek and isle of scale and dubai and haven island in new york where diana and gray kind of shared that the handler duties i i really thought that was re refreshing um because i just think the whole the whole diana 47 thing although it's still like really beloved and cherished i just think from a storytelling perspective their bond has gone as far as you can take it uh, especially now that we've had the same ending for the last three games um I if it's further entering the series will recontextualize that in an interesting way, so it might improve the plot of the um of Hitman Three specifically. But um, yeah. I guess we'll, it'll take a long time to find out it if will. that's true or yeah. not. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully they retcon it and bring Lucas Gray back somehow. <laughs> oh, he shot into the trees and said, <laughs> "Yeah," or well, the bullet <laughs> flew through his you know jaw or something. <laughs> I mean, technically that is possible. Yeah, it is. I'd, it totally is. You know, unlikely but possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Um, 47 probably got a good look at him and thought, mm, check his pulse. Yeah, he's definitely dead. <laughs> All right, I'll take his clothes now and wear them in Berlin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah is that what he did? Where, where did he get that outfit Pretty from? much, I think. I think it was like, I don't know what it was. So, yeah, obviously, like, I feel like, I, I, I honestly do feel like this the overarching story, particularly in this trilogy, has been underappreciated. Um, obvious, but obviously it's subjective. Like, there's players like myself and... Xavier that like love the story and that's one of the things we love most about the trilogy and then there's players that like don't care for it at all they're just there to solve the puzzles they're there to speed run they're there to do wall bangs mm -hmm. whatever um <laughs> and then I think there's also players like yourself Tim that like do appreciate the story but you're not as crazy about it as players like us <laughs> like <laughs> That so, would be true, yes. So it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on the story. Like, do you... Yeah. I mean, obviously it's not your favourite aspect of the game, but do you still appreciate it on some level? I do. Um, I just want to start off with, I think the story doesn't... Like, one of the first avenues that people hear, like, learn about, okay, what should I appreciate appreciate about this game that's coming out is through game journalists reviews of a game mm. and i think the problem with hitman's story is that much of the story is not told in the cutscenes or not told through one or two playthroughs mm. it's told through the missions and over here in conversations yeah that's i think point. people that write yes. reviews don't get the time it's not their fault at all i'm not no. right i think they're doing a great job reviewing the game um but they don't get the time to play through and understand the entire story so often yeah. the story gets uh, bad rep or... in the reviews because oh there's not much in the cutscenes um right and the cutscenes elevate as you learn more and more through the missions so mm. um i appreciate the story the more i play each mission um every time i play hitman game i revert to 
oh, the story didn't interest me very much. And then as I play more and more, because I'm, I'm more interested in mechanics, but I like overhearing conversations. As I keep playing, the story intrigues me more and more, and I become far more um, invested in it. Um, I think for me still, and this might be nostalgia talking, the older games stories had this had a larger mystique to them. I guess I didn't really... Maybe because I didn't understand a lot about them, they drew me in a lot more, and I still don't really understand the full plots of some of the older games. But um, Code M47 has a special place in my heart because of its... I like the idea of taking out all of your um, family, effectively. Um, <laughs> it was what the game was about. Yeah. We can all identify with that <laughs> at times, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, especially 47, because his family is not particularly... Uh, kind i'd say they're very um <clears throat> yeah they have a very interesting agenda but uh i don't know i do the more i play hitman games the more i appreciate the stories which is far different from other games like and i was talking to one of the uh writers on twitter about this once where i said most games have uh, not most lots of games have uh, audio books and like not audio books what they call audio logs and like law books you can read in the in the games um which deliver more of the plot the story but hitman has figured out a solution to that sort of game stopping like oh now you're playing skyrim or whatever now you can read this book and you just stop to the gameplay to read the book hitman has figured out a way to um have lots of lore and the story delivered through um characters who are speaking next to you as you're like sneaking around corners and waiting and planning yeah, out your next move absolutely and it's it's really figured out a way to deliver that plot without you having to stop the gameplay yeah and i think yeah. that specifically is why i appreciate the plot and the story of hitman mm. a lot yeah it's because even though i'm more of a mechanical player mm. i end up appreciating the story because i hear so much of it just by playing which yeah. is incredibly well designed especially in the new games like massive kudos to io for pulling that off like yeah. that's very impressive yeah so I, I think that is what i appreciate the most yeah yeah i completely agree and i i think um mm. in our outline of the podcast discussion guide we're going to try and touch on that more in more detail later but i absolutely agree with the whole kind of it's almost like the story is being told through various mediums like it's not it's the sandbox storytelling versus the the linear overarching storytelling Mm -hmm. in the cutscenes. um it's not just the cutscenes telling the story it's also all the just all these countless characters that you can eavesdrop on yeah. Often just by chance, because they might be hidden in a little pocket of the level that you might, if you don't replay the map enough, you might not even ever encounter them. Yeah. But they have, but they share these like really interesting and insightful snippets of dialogue that give a whole new layer to like really really important characters. Um, Absolutely. Like uh, the the like in Hawks Bay, for example. Um, near the the truck with the um, with the flares in the back that you can shoot mm-hmm. as you make Explosive. your escape, yeah, yeah. Um, there's some enforcers like digging some graves in the sand to bury the people that they murdered in the house. Oh yeah, and they share a little bit of dialogue about Lucas Gray working because he Lucas Gray is their boss. They're members of the private militia, and they have a quick conversation about Gray. Um, how he was like the the way he discovered Providence was because he was working as a sec- head of security for Eugene Cobb, who was a high ranking Providence operative, <coughs> who was a banker at the bank in New York. What's it called? Morgan Gates and Co. Is that yeah, it? something like that. Yeah, something um, like that. I think that's the law firm. <coughs> oh, the, that's it. Yeah, the, the name, law firm. The name of the bank, Fitzpatrick something. Yates is yeah. Uh... Do you recall the name Milton of the Fitzpatrick. bank? Fitzpatrick. Melton that's Fitzpatrick. It. That's right. He's a high-ranking banker. At... <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. And like, just little, and that just adds a whole layer or ba- or a huge chunk of the puzzle to that character's backstory. Um, mm. And there's very, very limited information shared in the main cutscenes about the backstories of characters. And uh, if you don't happen to venture near those enforcers, you'll never get that piece of. Yeah. that character's backstory and that's just one example there's so many other examples of that um spread throughout all the maps throughout the trilogy and uh, like 20 plus maps so it's it's incredible storytelling it's not just 
watching a few cutscenes, it, it, it's it's just it's, it's you hard being to in a world and learning through the like different ways you play. It's like it rewards the way you're playing the game in different ways. It rewards yeah. rewarding that because different paths you take will teach you different things about the story. Yeah, it's, complete, it's very unique to Hitman and yeah. very few other games, I think. Yeah, yeah. and I think mm. IO have like become incredibly they're like masters of world building like i think the the levels obviously it's not just as we keep saying it's not just the cutscenes that craft the story it's also the levels because they're the setting you can't have a good story without a setting or uh an imaginative backdrop and uh, Mm -hmm. that's what i'd like to touch on next is the extraordinary lengths that io go to to craft these amazing backdrops and settings to this (laughs) <laughs> really really cool story and i know xavier you've you love exploring the maps you've helped me re- do research for at least one law video i've made in the past um i remember you helped me do some research about the delgados yeah and you, yeah that was fun he xavier just helped me do like background research of those characters and he'd like go into apartments in mumbai and watch the the news reels on televisions and stuff like there's all this hidden law like in all these little pockets of all the levels it's just amazing would you be able to share something like would you be able to elaborate on that at all Xavier not that specific time but just like what you've got out of exploring the maps well actually just to touch on that I was actually going to mention um I felt like before I, I conducted that research, then I, I pretty much had all the information I needed for the Delgado cartel. And then I started researching and looking for her information. And I was blown away by how much I had missed. Like how you said, like, wow. if you just watch the television program, um, the news will come on and talk about, you know, a previous incident that 47 was connected to or a target that was recently killed off in the previous yeah. mission. And it just adds so much more to it. And it was just, uh, I was just, oh, wow. Like, there's so much more. And when I went to uh, uh, Columbia again, just eavesdropping on so much of the dialogue that's just done for just that one mission. And uh, little breadcrumbs have been sprinkled. I, I feel till this day, I, I know it, this is not the last that we've seen of Hector Delgado, for sure. Mm. He is definitely going to make an appearance one day because he is the last surviving Delgado at this time. Mm. And uh, I, I don't believe his suicide is canon because they mention him in a news briefing um, after that mission saying that he's the sole survivor of the Del- Delgado cartel right now, the, the last living family mm. member. So um, I it's just little things like that. And... Mm. Um, kind of giving you a little bit of a glimpse of, hey, you know, that could be a possible target in the future. You know, he could get his act together and, and actually maybe bring the Delgado cartel back into operation uh, uh, successfully. And maybe Agent 47 might have to take it down again in the f- future, which which I love because IO, I feel, has been doing that since the first game. Just kind of like saying, you know what, we don't know if we're going to head th- that direction, but we're going to plant the seeds. Yeah. And... Mm. And I just I just love all of that. Just and even in just little snippets of dialogue, um, but researching that in Colombia, the Del- Delgado cartel, made me realize how much dialogue we probably still haven't even noticed yeah, uh, after yeah. countless times of playing the games. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And often, more often than not, you're more focusing on the strategy that you're trying to develop, or you know, you're not even really paying attention to what people are saying right. in the background. So. Yeah, like yeah. a video on YouTube the other day, it popped up and it was about, it was Dahlia and she was calling, I think it was Ezra Berg or something on her phone. It's like, can you check into this uh, Tobias Reaper guy? You've showed him. Awesome. Yeah. I'm like, I've oh, never heard that so before. so cool. Like, really? Wow. Yeah, that was so cool. I, it was all sorts of stuff like she, that. She spoke thing. to Ezra Berg, the target from um, I, I Colorado. I think so, yeah. I think it was Ezra, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. you're correct. She She's on the phone with Ezra Berg, who, yeah. who later on we meet in Colorado. And back then, you're just kind of like, who who is this guy? If you listen to that, it, it was kind of like a foreshadowing of your next yeah. target. Yeah, yeah. And th- that, that happens a lot, doesn't it? There's foreshadowing elements. Like, you've got... Don um, Yates was foreshadowed a lot, I think. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. when when you actually think... I know you could 
Yeah, I know you could find like pamphlets to Haven Island throughout the the course of the game, and like mm. like little advertisements of locations uh, coming up. Yeah, yeah, like advertise like brochures of Haven Island appearing in New York and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and lots of red herrings like Jin Po was talked about a lot. Yeah, never a yes. comment, but you always thought he might be. Is like, yeah. oh, <laughs> that's so true. But no, he just plays into the larger narrative. Well, yeah. not necessarily a target. Yeah. And one of the, one of the things I also love is just from the story spelling. Sorry, the storytelling world building perspective is just all the zany characters that they come up with, like Jason Portman, <laughs> Florida Man, uh, the hippie. You know, there's just so many of them, <laughs> yes. and the fact that they can just like reappear in different maps. I love that. Yeah, uh, the hippie what, especially is everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what What was the name of um, Jordan Cross's manager, band manager? Oh, uh, uh, you know who I mean, Betsy yeah, or something. Uh, uh, Tri Trixie, uh, oh, Trixie yeah, Barrett? Barrett. Was it Trixie yes. Barrett or something? Barrett. Dexie Barrett. Dexie Dexie Barrett. Barrett. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah, the fact that she reappears in Mendoza and have you noticed yeah. that? Yeah, like, and the news reporter. The news reporter. Yeah, the news reporters that's... are two good people that you can walk between their camera. Yeah, and, um... the, in the car in the car park yeah. in Mendoza, the news reporter. That's the same news reporter that appears in <laughs> Paris and also in Miami. Miami. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just like and Corvo it... Black mentioned previously, and there's all sorts. Yeah. Of, they go on forever. Yeah. Yeah, and this is just like a core element of the game that so many players just overlook, like that they don't mm. make these subtle connections. Like it's just astounding the amount of world building that IO have done, and just like the on so many different levels, they've just interconnected these various maps mm. um, on so many levels. Like just with all the foreshadowing and the reoccurring characters and the little snippets of dialogue hinting to future events and and red herrings. Like it's just <laughs> oh. so many games don't have the it's hard to convince the people funding the games to be able to let you put in a bunch of stuff that may not never be seen by most players. Yeah, so the fact that yeah. I could, especially when they were originally like tied to Square Enix, convince Square Enix to be like, okay, players might only play through the game once. Can we please put in like a million percent more stuff than the players <laughs> will ever see? And they're yeah. like, okay, sure. Then and that set the groundwork for the rest of the games. Yeah. Absolutely. Hitman's like an iceberg. A lot of players only see the tip. But there's just so uh, much submerged underneath that to be discovered. That's a great metaphor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like so true. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so good. Um, <laughs> and I think like just the aesthetic. I think like a lot of people talk about ranking the maps, um, but I think one thing that IO did incredibly impressively on every single map was the aesthetics of every level. Like. Yeah, mm -hmm. every level is just so impressive in its visual design and the way they've recrafted every location is you can just it's almost like that's why I want to play VR so much because I know it, right <laughs> <laughs> oh. even the maps I don't like from a gameplay perspective like I don't know Bangkok for example it's not my favorite from a gameplay perspective No, but the visuals are just incredible yeah. like, I cannot get over it. I will go to that map just to experience the visuals. And yeah, yeah. Even, like the butterfly even, house in the main... Yeah, the, butter, yeah, the butterflies yeah, flying around. And the giant like, golden elephants at the front. Like, yeah. Towards the river. It's incredible. Yeah. And also, like, like the the, sh the chefs doing all the um, the Asian fusion um, yeah. cuisine, you know, like <laughs> the, the sushi yeah. and everything. Yeah, <laughs> so cool. You cannot fault them for their the artists' work in those games. They're incredible. No, um, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the aesthetics are like just incredible. Um, Even on the most linear map in the series, the uh, what's it what's it called? Can't remember the train the train map. The tr yeah, the Carpathian um, Mountains. Amazing, um, like you flying past all these things, you go over a bridge through a tunnel. There's all these like yeah ice lit ice lakes. These um trees come up. It's incredible. It's a like beautiful map in yeah. its own way. It's very in its own right. Like yeah. even the maps which people are like oh it's not very hitmany. The art is hitmany. Yeah, <laughs> it's incredible. the art is hitman. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, did you have anything to add to that perspective, Xavier? 
Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think they did a phenomenal job of capturing the essence of each location. And um, I, I've heard that complaints as well, or critique, I guess you can say, about how, oh, this level was too easy, or it's, uh, you know, I can get through it very quickly, or it's not difficult enough. But I just love just spending time with each level. And uh, even talking about VR, one of the most unpopular levels, which is Colorado, I'm actually uh, looking forward to checking it out in VR because, like, could you imagine the Ezra Berg interrogation, but in VR, like, actually oh, being yeah. there and, like, watching <laughs> this go down and the eerie music and everything. And um, it's just, it, they they really did. I feel like uh, the teams they set up for each location and their responsibilities for how they wanted to play out, everybody did such a phenomenal job just capturing, like, each level has its own personality, uh, each location, whether it's Sapienza or Carpathian Mountains, even though uh, Carpathian Mountains is very linear, it's just the perfect like ending for this series. It's just like yeah. you, it, they basically give it to you on a plate. Like here, you're Agent Forty Seven. You can either just merc everybody and just wipe out the whole train if you want to, uh, or you know you can just do this silent assassin if you really want to and just take out Edwards and. I just love that because uh, even with, with with some of the uh, contracts that they've been c putting out, they kind of show you you can get through that very stealthily if you really wanted to. It's set up that way. Mm. Um, or you can just go John Wick and just assassinate everybody <laughs> on the train. Yeah, that's and true. Yeah. yeah. I, I love that too. I love how, I love how everybody... Uh, like on on that sp specific part of that mission specifically how everybody knows that oh you know our cargo is agent 47 the legend and i love how there's dialogue in there kind of oh my gosh i can't believe he's here like can you believe it we actually captured him and yeah. oh i bet you he can't do good in a fist fight and all this stuff and <laughs> yeah it's just so it's hilarious i yeah. love it yeah it's so good I, I love the references as well to the other games like i uh I haven't actually overheard it myself. I can't. I can't remember who was telling me. Um, I think it was during a stream the other day. Um, but someone mentioned in the chat that um, if you follow Diana around with, I can't remember the name of the target that shadows her everywhere. Tamal you, Vidal, I think. Vid, Vidal, is it? Sorry. Vidal, Tamal, Vidal, Vidal. I can't remember. We all know. Do you remember the name about. of the target, uh, Xavier, <laughs> the uh, female target on Mendoza? From Mendoza, uh, Tamar? uh, Tamara Vidal, yep. Tamara Tam Vidal. Tam Tamara Vidal, yeah. And yeah. she's like asking um, Diana about her career and stuff. And she mentions Blake Dexter. And then Diana goes, oh no, he only existed in a parallel universe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just those little in jokes. Great. So good. Mm. So good. I love it. Yeah, I, I, I feel like they added that in there. Um, I mentioned this in the chat, too, where obviously the Hitman community understands that Absolution is a bit of a black sheep. Yeah. Because um, it's very 50-50 it's very with the community. Either you really love the, the linear style and, and kind of like the updated format, or you just despise it, you just don't like it. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess you can be in the middle and just be like, oh, I don't really care. But mm -hmm. I have, uh, I remember I played a, a little bit of a demo a long time ago, I believe it's when he's like in the subway. I, I haven't played Absolution yet, but from what I have played, I did I did like it. It's kind of like a, a bit of a refreshing take on, on Agent 47. But um, shockingly enough, there's actually a, a bit of a community that actually prefers the more linear style in Hitman mm. rather than the sandbox type mm. traditional levels that we have now in the trilogy. Yeah. And... That's what's great about forty seven or, or Agent Forty Seven and, and IO is they add little like obviously in, in Dartmoor, that's a little bit of a departure from your usual expectations of a hitman level. You could take up the murder mystery and then of course in Carpathian Mountains it's very linear, but it's just basically just a, a, a final nail in the coffin for Providence. So mm. yeah. I just love how they are open-minded and they understand that not every level has to be uh, Santa Fortuna where you have three separate um, isolated areas to, to mm. tackle Mumbai. or yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or Mumbai, even though I, I love, absolutely love the intricacies of those levels and the Kashmirian, but like, I feel like each level they give a little bit of its own little twist, its own unique style and 
every single one of them is memorable, whether it's conflicting like Colorado or Carpathian Mountains, or it's just absolutely just breathtaking like Sapienza or Paris or Miami, mm-hmm. um, like mm-hmm. visually. Yeah. And it's it's just a, it's a great adaptation of, of what they've been able to embark with this trilogy. I, I absolutely love it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I totally think- agree. Going back to the the final mission, obviously a lot of it's not a fan favorite with a lot of the community. But um, from a storytelling perspective, I I love it because yeah, it's just mm-hmm. such Same. a direct route to mm-hmm. your final target, which is you know the main antagonist of the entire trilogy, and you know you've you as the player you've gone through twenty freaking locations <laughs> to get to <laughs> yeah. that point where you can finally kill that bastard you know? <laughs> and uh you've just you're on a you're on a like a single trajectory to get there you know nothing's gonna get in your way um so i thought it was like in its design it was a really good metaphor for you know tunnel vision i'm gonna take out this final target mm-hmm. no questions asked i'm not gonna get distracted yeah. by any you know like <laughs> um to use like to use like a horrifyingly corporate like dialect i'd say it's like there's a synergy between the like lore and the plot and the level design there it's like okay we've taken everything and we've got the, we've yeah as you said we've now got this tunnel vision we've yeah. now got this like everything's coming to this go yeah, yeah just go <laughs> you can do anyone you want you it, go for it yeah yeah, yeah. As, as you yeah. said Xavier, like just go nuts <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, ha- have exactly some it. have some fun with it and yeah make the most of it yeah. um so yeah, I think IO have become masters of balancing that storytelling act of, of 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 balancing you know overarching story and interweaving it with the the sandbox um, art of storytelling. Um, I, although there was like a secret ending at the end of Hitman Three, I, I would like to see player choice have more impact on the overarching story in future games if. If we're going to have an overarching story again, I mean, as we were saying earlier in the podcast, that like I'd love to see them just go back to say contracts, that style mm-hmm. of, of like having individual missions that are, are not associated with each other at all. Um, that would just it was, it's always cool. There's only one story level in contracts, right? It was just the last level. Yeah, the just the last, story. just the last map. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Very different. Yeah. Um. So, I thought we'd briefly uh sorry because i just am conscious of time i thought we'd briefly not that any of us have to be anywhere so i don't know why i'm saying that but i thought we'd briefly mention uh each our most favorite mission story uh from the trilogy from each game yeah from each game or from the trilogy oh probably from the trilogy because otherwise (laughs) (laughs) we'll be we'll be discussing what nine in total (laughs) (laughs) So, should we start with you, Xavier? What was your favorite mission story from? Well, firstly, shall we shall we just briefly like highlight the importance of mission stories? Like Tim, what what do you think is really valuable about mission stories in each map? You know, what? mission stories are interesting in Hitman because they've evolved over time. What they mean, like in mm. Hitman One. They were called opportunities, and they were more like ways to get to a place, often. Um, Sometimes it was just how to get into, like, the tunnels in Marrakesh, and sometimes it was how to isolate a target. But Mm. as of recent times, they've become, they've turned into mission stories, and they've Mm. become a lot more about, like, usually how to isolate a target or how to get very close to it. Um, And I think mission stories themselves, they try and tell... They try and if you play all of them, um, the goal is now to like give you a pretty decent understanding of the lore of each map. Um, mm. If you're not the type of player to play through incessantly over and over and over and do every challenge, it's mm. just if you play these three mission stories, you will understand pretty much the the main like plot beats of each. Yeah, map. definitely. Like the that's that's plots. become the goal. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's it's changed over time into that and that's yeah. why you have 19 or whatever mission story in sapienza and yeah. three in Chongqing king or something or yeah. yeah that's why it's different yeah yeah and so, i think i think that's been like a running theme throughout the whole series like obviously you start with codename 47 yeah. i think 
just about all the ma- all the levels in that game only had one mission story or you know uh, way, opportunity like, there's a way to do things yeah <laughs> yeah and it was obviously very very cryptic um there was no hand holding whatsoever uh but as as the series has prog- progressed it's become more and more player friendly and particularly with this latest trilogy where you actually have the option in the in-game menu to turn on not only like mission guidance but you can actually select how thorough it is <laughs> You know, you can have minimal assistance or you can have full assistance. So markers on the screen, which tells you exactly where to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah precisely. Some people complain about, but I, I think it's good for some players who maybe they're more like the absolution style, like Xavier was saying before. Yeah. Um, some people just like being guided. Yeah. That's what well, they find fun. I didn't see why you would get rid of something like that. Yeah. Because it's not like hardcore Hitman gameplay. It's like, yeah. No, that gets more players in. I yeah. think it's good. It yeah. is good. And I really like the fact that in this final entry of the trilogy, they've like taken, um, obviously they do have that guidance feature for some of the mission stories, but for others they don't, such as, um, right. <clears throat> such as the nightclub Berlin. owner in Berlin and yeah. the lawyer in uh, Mendoza. Um, Oh, yeah, the lawyer, yeah. yeah. Who like talks about each different like assassinations? Yeah, I can't. I can vaguely remember. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, going they, back. They've, um, oh, I'll just add quickly. They've gone into more of the here the three mission stories that the uh, that are sort of marked on the in the missions are far more. They're the ones you need to play to understand the plot like, mm-hmm. fully. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of unmarked mission stories now, which may be sort of related to challenges, but mm-hmm. they. You need to find them. Hitman yeah. 3 is a lot more blood money style where you yeah. sort of figure it out and yeah. they give you a few tips along the way. Yeah, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the other thing that I, I, I noticed and admire about uh, the way that they implemented these opportunities is the fact that, for me at least, the way that I approach them is I like having fun trying to find out which one they considered by they, I mean, I.O., they considered canon because obviously we know that there's one specific kill in each location that will more than likely be the canon kill for that target moving forward. And I love trying to figure out uh, which one. Usually it's the most um, accidental and maybe over uh, over dramatized one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's, it's so much fun just trying to figure out exactly where IO is taking the story with those canon kills. Uh, like for example, in Paris, uh, that one. I th- did we actually ever? Yeah, I think the the stage falling on Novikov is the cannon kill for him. Mm-hmm. I think. And it's um, named after that kill, so it would make sense. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, because I know um, uh, Dolly Margolis gets the call, and she's like, "Oh well, you know, whatever." Victor was just small, a part of of the bigger scheme mm-hmm. here. I'm the one who runs the show, and. Uh, and then the whole Helmet Kruger meeting up, I believe that was canon too for Dolly Margolis's ending, maybe getting poisoned. But it's just always fun just trying to find out uh, exactly how these targets are uh, canonly killed in, in the series. And just the fact that they give you a choice of, of so many different ways and so many different opportunities. Uh, but I feel like as soon as you enter a mission, they kind of steer you in that main cannon kill like the first opportunity that kind of rises is more than likely typically the one that they're kind of saying all right this is basically how we want agent 47 to take out the target and if you want to go down that route awesome if not if you find a more creative way of doing it it's all yours and i just love that about each installment of this trilogy um but i do have if, if, if we get on that, I do have like a favorite uh, mission story or opportunity from one, two and three I've, separately that I could summarize really quickly. Yeah, if you like. It. Go for it, yeah. Uh, for Hitman 1, my favorite was the uh, Silvio Caruso mission story as well as the Francesco DeSantis one. With uh, Silvio Caruso, I love the one where you just make him go absolutely mad and insane, uh, mm. thinking that his mom is still alive or yeah, a ghost or cool. some sort of, like she's she's lurking around and making things turn on and noises and 
<laughs> that's my favorite one because he just faints and you're just like, okay. Um, Silvio Caruso is such a complex character when you really get to, you know, do the whole uh, therapy session with him and you find out just how traumatized he was with his mother's relationship. And then yeah. I love Francesca DeSantis's Mrs. Story because uh, the one that I I, I like is uh, where you dress or you take the disguise as the uh, the golf instructor and her basically her romantic fling. And then you meet up with her and you're just sitting in the shadows and she's like, wait, is that you? And she's like, oh, my God, it's not you. And um, it's just funny because I feel like out of all of them, Francesca DeSantis was probably like the least vindictive i think she was just kind of like a wrong place wrong time type of thing and unfortunately she yeah. had to be a, a target for 47 but um i love that from hitman one I, I thought that was a really fun mission story and then for hitman 2 uh my favorite from that one is the Kashmirian in mumbai i, I just so. love yeah okay. i love how <laughs> you can manipulate that to your advantage and it's just it's so epically done because you're basically helping out another assassin and he's just not very good. So, so in he's 47, terrible. Yeah, he's just like, here, let me fix your sight for you. Let me, you know, put the gun where it's supposed to be aimed. And um, yeah, it's, it's hilarious. I, although the Kashmirian has a very, very good sense of style because that's one of my favorite disguises or suits in the game. Yes. And uh, for Hitman 3... My favorite is um, the the in Chongqing when uh, Agent Forty Seven uh, with uh, has to basically use his mind to basically take out his target Huff, I Hush. believe Shit. his name Hush. Hush. Yeah, that's a good and it, it was it was absolutely like, I I didn't expect that because I played it completely blind I didn't see it coming and I was like wow I can't believe he's gonna <laughs> challenge Agent Forty Seven he has no idea what he's in store for so I thought that was pretty amusing with that yeah. mission story but uh, and those are just like small little tidbits and, and quite honestly I, I think there's so much to to really delve into with with opportunities mission stories and it's just fun like I know yeah. some people think it's very handholdy but I feel like it fleshes out the story for you a, uh, a lot better than uh, taking the reins. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I agree wholeheartedly with um, your point about the, the rich backstories to particularly Silvio Caruso. Like, I, I actually forgot about that whole subplot of him mm-hmm. like being terrified <laughs> of his mother and, you know... <laughs> Um, ha- having developed yeah. some one, though, kind of it? like yeah. personality disorder from the trauma of it all, um, and I think it's um, he's actually afraid of women. I think that's the like, like he <laughs> that's gets a repercussion. Um, yeah, yeah, but just yeah, phobia, I think it is. Yeah, so that's just his, like his mother had the gardener. I think sleep with his high school prom date or something like that, and I was mm. just like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> yeah. it's really deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah really really deep um and i i I concur with the the cashmerian as well i i like just about any mission story where you can create a proxy kill i just huge fan of um so yeah with tim what was your favorite mission story from the trilogy um there's quite a few you've already mentioned lots of them xavier um there's one in mendoza which i don't want to spoil here just in case anyone hasn't played it because it's so good but it involves proxy kills and it's if you follow the Corvo Black and um, Winemaker story, a mission story, to the as far as you possibly can, because there's lots of um, that one's similar to the Kashmir, and there's lots of alternate ways you can like do different things. wormholes you can go down. Yeah, branching yeah. paths and like ways you can do stuff. But if you if you push that, that thing all the way to the end as far as you possibly can, you can kill both targets by a proxy in probably the best proxy kill in the series um oh, by the last cool. one can't um, wait I've, to I've, me it's equal with the you haven't played it so i don't want to spoil it for it, you yeah. or any of the people watching you haven't yeah. played it yeah so play that one and it's for me it's equal to the um Kashmirian. and for me the other one i like is the jordan cross kill where he pushes ken morgan out a window which is yeah so yeah, yeah that's a great one too yeah like, i love so it exactly i love that one when, Cross kills girlfriend when you think about good? most of the maps like most of the targets just absolutely loathe one another and uh 
Um, That's yeah, true. Just all, all yeah. the interesting uh, relationships that they have going on. It's just another insane yeah. aspect of the the just. Oh, I'm trying to think of the right word. Just the incredible or astonishing scope to which IO have crafted the storytelling mm. within this trilogy is just on so many levels. Like, uh, and I feel it's not like just the mechanics that are working on a clockwork. It's also the stories. Yeah. As well, they all interconnect in interesting ways. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've only been talk we've been talking about it for like an hour and a half, and I feel like we've only just scratched the surface on all the cool things, all the amazing things <laughs> that that they do. Um, Maybe you need a part two for this one. Yeah, we we might. Yeah. Um, we we better we better start wrapping things up because otherwise uh, people might not watch <laughs> much further. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. uh, I think we'll we'll just finish that. We'll, we'll firstly thank you, um, Xavier, for sharing your insights on many aspects of the storytelling. Well, my in, pleasure. In thank in you. This trilogy. Um, I think we're going to cut things off now with our usual mailbag segment. Um, before, but before yeah. we do, um, yeah, again, just a, a, a huge thank you for sharing your very valuable and appreciated knowledge on him, not just him and law, but just various aspects of storytelling within the trilogy. Um, you've, you've raised some really good yeah. points uh, that I definitely wouldn't have been able to. And... Uh, also, just a huge thank you for coming on. Um, it's been yeah. really well, cool. It's, it's a pleasure. You guys are doing a phenomenal job with the podcast. And uh, I invite, you know, as many people who, who are in the community to want to come on and, and share their love for Agent 47 or IO yeah. or Diana. Like, definitely come on because of the, the Hitman community, it's a very niche crowd. And I love, you know, talking about it with everybody. And we, I, I believe, we're extremely lucky that we've gotten the, the chance to to get a trilogy. That's just mm. by far <laughs> yeah. anything I would have imagined. Yeah. So right. I, I, I think the big thank you goes to IO for uh, devoting all of these years uh, to really just bring a masterclass of a game. I, yeah. I really do love it. Whether you're uh, a speedrunner or you just really love glitching out with wall bangs and stuff like that, or you just love the story like we do. Mm. Um, Hitman has a little bit of something for everybody. Absolutely, so yeah. thank you to the community for, for always, uh, you know, supporting IO because, you know, they are an independent company. And, uh, you know, with 007, hopefully this is just going to be like the beginning of the next chapter for them. So yeah, uh, I'm sure we will definitely see Hitman and Agent 47 come back yeah, in the yeah. very near future. I, I, th I think with the success of part three, there's just like, we, we can't just put this for us for too long. Like, no, we got to no. keep going. Got to keep that keep with sense. it yeah um i think we were discussing yeah. earlier like uh before we started recording we were talking about the fact that how incredible it would be to come in as a brand new player at this point and play the trilogy from paris all the way through with yeah like 20 plus locations mm -hmm. Imagine available. That. <laughs> yeah and oh. i mean had they done this game had they done the whole trilogy as a single game there's just no way they could have produced something so incredible because obviously it's this extended period of time that has allowed them to, you know, releasing it in three installments has really allowed them to make it um, in the best possible way that they can. Um, yeah. It's one of and, those, if you try to make this as one game, it'd be one of the most ridiculously over scoped games of all time. But the fact yeah. that they, okay, let's do it three times. Yeah. Okay, that works. It's one big game now. It's incredible. It's like yeah. one of the best like achievements in game development yeah. i've seen in a long time and i read they might be doing yeah, the same I thing agree. with 007 like trilogy that's so. that's what i think the ceo said they might do but yeah. i don't think it's confirmed so it's not confirmed so. okay sorry that, that's that's here so <laughs> yeah. be yeah. be pretty amazing if they did um and also um xavier you're obviously like always up for having a chat about hitman so where can people find you you're usually oh around. yeah if, if you're interested in, in, in chatting with me you can uh hit me up on the discord for all things hitman i'm on there as i believe xavier dj if not then dj professor x is me uh a little bit of a x-men fan there for anybody who caught that but um yeah if not you can you can see me because i you know i'm 
I'm a moderator on the All Things Hitman YouTube channel. So if you see me in the chat, I'll be in there. I'm I'm usually friendly. I don't bite. I don't say anything hateful or anything. But just watch out with what you say because uh, all the hateful <laughs> comments. I'm looking at you guys. Yeah, will get to you. <laughs> yeah. I'll get you. Yeah, and I just I, it's it's been so cool to have you on, man. Because obviously, I feel like we've known each other a fair while. Um, we've had some good chats. Uh, over the last yeah couple yeah of years. for sure um, so it's been so cool to finally like kind of meet you as close as possible as it is <laughs> over the internet in person yeah um, <laughs> uh, after all this pandemic hoopla is over I'll, I'll make a trip to australia and have a pint with you guys <laughs> yeah man yeah that'll be amazing yeah uh, my shout <laughs> yeah um so we're gonna finish things off with the mailbag segment um, we're gonna, so this week's, or this episode's question rather was, let me just bring it up. Um, so obviously in theme of the focus for this episode, um, with a story focus. So our question was, who is your favorite character from the world of the assassination trilogy and why? And we also just added in a note. It d- doesn't have to be a main character. It can be a target or other NPC too. So we kind of yeah. encourage people to think outside the box and other, cause otherwise everyone would have just been saying agent 47 <laughs> <laughs> or Diana, you know, and they're like completely fine answers, but also we wanted some, <laughs> some, uh, we the wanted to, things. yeah, we wanted to create some diverse discussion. So, um, did you want to kick things off Tim? with one? Yeah. So, um, Plover. Uh, Plover, you may know as uh, the creator of the uh, borders you see on our videos and uh, <laughs> and the logo. Uh, she redid the logo for us. So shout out to Plover for that. Um, so Plover says, one of my favorite characters in the World of Assassination trilogy has to be Lucas Gray, the Shadow Client, or Subject 6. He is arguably, arguably one of the most complex characters the franchise has seen. And the fact that he doesn't even appear in the in he doesn't even first appear in the trilogy is what draws me to him. He first appears in Hitman Damnation as Subject Six, 47's relentless bully. He was such a successfully written character that was so hateable it made me despise him. However, after the World of Assassination trilogy, he obviously has become an infinitely more interesting and important character to 47's backstory. His appearance in the comic his under, undeniable brotherly dynamic with 47 and the explanation that was given by Dr. Ortmeier to connect it back to the novel also expands on our favorite bold assassin. Moreover, Gray was the perfect way of going about doing, doing so. He was an antagonist turned triagonist and that had an endless amount of potential and probably still does. I really hope he returns in future segments one way or another. And I... I completely agree with you, and I didn't know that he appeared in Hitman Damnation, which yeah, is neither, the entire novel Absolution, I think. Yeah, so, neither did wow. I. And he's that like my favorite character, and I had no idea yeah. he appeared in that novel. Like a mean guy in that book. So yeah, yeah. I guess they retconned that as well. Yeah, uh, I think they Yeah, because I, I, I think he actually yeah. gets killed in that, if I'm not mistaken. So they definitely just rewrote the character. Yeah. Yes, there's hope they'll bring him back then in yes. the future entry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I found the script now for my Lucas Gray video. Because <laughs> that was so eloquently, uh, that was so well put. Well done, Plover. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was a great writer. Thank you, Plover, for that um, yeah. input. You've taught, I'm sure, everyone a lot because you've actually bothered to read the novels. So, um, yeah. <laughs> great job there. Yeah, yeah. props, props I, to you, Plover. That's awesome. I had yeah. no idea Plover. She's obviously very knowledgeable with the uh, the, the law. So, I had no idea yeah. she was that much. I have to get her on for part two. <laughs> <laughs> I have to have <laughs> a four, sure, four, four, four guests on, two co hosts. Four guests on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two guests, right. co hosts, sorry. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Plover. Yeah, thanks for that, Plover. That that's really awesome. And um, sorry, just before we move on to the next one, because um, Gray is my favorite character from the trilogy. Um, I I just agree that he. I think I already mentioned this earlier in the podcast, but I'll just say it one more time. I I just think that 
there was so much more they could have done with that character and just mm-hmm. really made the future it, if they'd kept him around it, it, there was just the scope for like interesting storytelling was just oh, I just really they should have just killed off any other character aside from him. <laughs> There's a shred of hope like point yeah, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just have to go with the retcon. I O. Yeah. Come on, retcon. Oh. Retcon Lucas Gray. It was all a dream. Yeah. No, <laughs> oh, speaking of dreams, I love. I didn't mention this earlier when we were talking about the overarching story. I love the the reappearance he made in the dream sequence. Oh yeah. Oh, it, was so was... it was so endearing. It was so endearing. So good. It really put. 47 in this little like vul- that, that's like the most vulnerable I've ever seen 47 um, yeah. just getting schooled by Lucas Gray like don't let the toxins yeah. uh, appeal to your fears or whatever he says like yeah the- that moment we're surrounded by every target he's yeah yeah is one of my oh, favorite that was so impactful. Yeah. the dream Incredible. sequence was like probably yeah. my favorite mm-hmm. part of the whole Hitman 3 story that I moment when it. when all the targets appear around forty seven was like oh my goodness it really makes you realize like that's not even all of his targets that's just for yeah. his trilogy yeah like it's Look insane yeah and it makes you realize how many people you've actually killed like yeah he's really, yeah. <laughs> very much like swarmed by <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy yeah um, did you want to read your one Xavier oh yes. Uh, this one is from Agent Andy. Uh, they said, I really love Alexa. Her backstory is really intriguing, especially the further you get into Carlisle history. Her demeanor is hilarious, going from stoic and cold acting to the hysterical screaming into a pink pillow. There was so much potential for her character, and it's shown really well through having her own level. She's hilarious, has some pretty unique kill opportunities, great kills great story and is at the center of one of the best locations in the world of assassination trilogy plus the way she calls the constant secretary to his face during the meeting which to add to that that was when she did that i was just like she really has absolutely no respect for edwards at all (laughs) she just does not care (laughs) no absolutely not and the way it was actually her that forced him to in hitman 2 to inject himself with the yeah the kill switch yeah you're right during yeah. the Isle of Scale to test his loyalty. <laughs> mm. Yeah, she she's badass. She's like, takes she no definitely business. Is. She's awesome. I absolutely love Alex. Oh, yeah. yeah, she's so good. And yeah, yeah Dartmoor, obviously, Dartmoor is a huge, huge, huge remembrance from, from part three. Like, yeah. that whole level, everything you can do with it, the Carlisle family, it's just perfect. The whole Knives Out references, which is also a great movie for anybody who hasn't seen it. Everyone uh, it, it seen definitely it. influenced the George. location. I recommend everybody to watch them because I actually watched it after I played the mission mm-hmm. and I was like, oh my god, this is such a great movie. So <laughs> I definitely recommend it. Yeah, cool. And discussing our favorite mission stories before, I think a worthy mention should have gone to the detective story in that map. Yeah, probably yes. the biggest um, mission story ever yeah. in the whole series, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Alexa was definitely my favorite partner. Um, yeah, and I just love that portrait of her in her main office in the library <laughs> with, it, with, the yeah, great, with the Great Danes. Yeah. <laughs> Classy. I actually felt bad for her when I, at the end of one of the mission stories, spoilers for the detective mission story, one of the endings, but you can... um effectively fool her into killing herself um i actually felt bad for her when you did that um yeah you, present it with yeah. Evidence. you can choose yeah. which evidence you present it with and she just drops off a balcony i'm like whoa i actually yeah, feel bad really for her bleak. Target. It, was, it was very <laughs> bleak but a very interesting hitman um opportunity yeah so yeah yeah th- thank you agent andy for that uh, yes thank you here. um so I've got one more from me, uh, from Dai Gurin, and Dai says, A character I really enjoy in the World of Assassination trilogy is Olivia Hall. She has an interesting bond with Lucas and is a link to his somewhat mysterious post-asylum pre-World of Assassination past. The way she goes from disliking and distrusting 47 in Hitman 2 and to Hitman 1 to being a valuable asset to him in Hitman 3 is very interesting to watch. 
she's a heavily underrated character who I don't see being talked about that much. The way we can see that she is deeply worried about killing one of the agents provides a different outlook on the thoughts of morality compared to the other characters. I would love to see more about about how she about her and Lucas met and how they bonded when they were both younger. She's genuinely interesting and often flies under the radar of the Hitman fans. Yeah, yeah I agree with that too. Couldn't agree more, hey. I've actually thought about doing a Hitman lore video on her. Um I'd love to see that. Yeah. <laughs> but she yeah, uh, she's a very underrated character and she faded into the background in the first couple games as she did. I said, yeah. Yeah. But that moment in Berlin where she when you're calling her and she says I think I killed one of them in a panicked voice. Mm. It says a lot about her character. She is not the same as you. And no. It's it's I don't know, that that impacted me. I that echoed in my mind for a while when I was first mm. playing that mission. Yeah. I was really happy that yeah, that's a really good point. And with Berlin, I just love the fact that they brought her character more front and center. Yeah. And gave her that opportunity to have some time in the spotlight acting as handler for berlin and chung chung ching as well yeah um yeah where she seems very spiteful as well in chung ching she is very she really hated uh what was the female target's name um, uh something rose oh no i'm thinking of sean rose um royce remember her name? royce Imogen Royce. Royce. Imogen Royce. Yeah, she yeah. was. She did not like Imogen Royce. <laughs> but I like to see some of her personality shine through, just in the way yeah. she like introduces the targets. Yeah. Yeah. She I suppose she. Yeah, Olivia. <laughs> she oh, sorry. Ha- she didn't have to. She didn't have to abide by that ICA neutrality. <laughs> She'd speak her <laughs> <Yeah>. mind. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Xavier. What were you gonna say? No, I was going to say, uh, uh, having Olivia involved is perfect because it shows you how desensitized uh, Agent 47, even Diana, and of course Lucas Gray, how they are with all the killing that's going on. Because yeah. Olivia Hall's not in that repertoire. She's basically just a hacker, mm. and she's not used to any of this bloodshed, really. She's always kind of in the background. She doesn't really have to see or, or kind of be uh, uh, in the forefront of that. Mm. So having that character is a really good way to just kind of hey snap you back into reality and be like hey man obviously we are dealing with agent 47 who is a very sadistic assassin and we have somebody like olivia hall who's just kind of like hey what have i got myself into yeah. but this is for the bigger picture mm. and uh absolutely a, a phenomenal character to to hopefully bring back i mean she she definitely uh would give that essence of kind of like an outsider's perspective into this whole world Oh, yeah. assassination. Yeah, definitely. So, one love... of the better representations of a hacker in a game, in a video game as well, because you see something like Watch Dogs, which is like the hacker game, but they're all going around with like guns and like RPGs <laughs> yeah. and just taking out every like civilian. I'm like, this doesn't seem like a hacker. This seems like a Marine or something. <laughs> I, don't know, I, I like yeah. that Olivia's like deeply morally concerned with killing someone, even though she's assisting in that, like a detached perspective usually yeah yeah it's very yeah. yeah 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 definitely she's um yeah she really as you say tim brought out that or reminded us of that human quality or conscience that mm. just doesn't seem to be as apparent in characters like 47 and diana and lucas gray even mm. though he's symbolically meant to be he represents 47's conscience as Diana represents 47's emotions. Huh. Um, I haven't really thought of it like that, but you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's cap things off with Volafan. So she states, for me, my favorite character is Arthur Edwards or the Constant, definitely the best of all 47's opponents in the whole franchise and an, and an incredibly charming character. The way he speaks, the way he messes with everyone's thoughts process, he managed to make everyone doubt themselves, especially 47, which is a kind of a first. He even managed to make 47 feel jealous in a twisted sort of way. If something seems like an... If something seems like a conspiracy, it probably isn't. When he scoffs in Mr. Fannin's face, hmm, not money, Mr. Fannin, that showed a glimpse of what a character he is. I love the quotes. 
He was about Providence, and I think he had a fair chance at bringing down 47. Even when he got caught, he used it as an opportunity to get his way, and knowing that he's just a fancy university graduate with no military training, that makes him even more fascinating. His reaction to being cornered in the train was priceless. He thought so high of himself that not even his own death was scary to him. Only losing his identity was what frightened him. That is a very unique character feature I appreciate very much what they made out of this character. Wow. That's a great analysis. That's, that, an analysis. that's a side of the constant I've never even contemplated. The fact that he was not even scared of his own demise, but was fearful of losing his status and power, his, his very identity. That's so true. He was entirely immersed in like the game almost and the idea yeah. of power. Yeah, he reminds me a lot of the character, I won't go into it much, but the character of Mor Moriarty in the Sherlock Holmes, uh, like books and films and such. He was oh, very this like- Like chess master. Yeah, chess master guy who goes back, <laughs> he stands back and takes pleasure exclusively. It feels like it's his entire life goal to mess with Sherlock and outgame him. Yeah, and outwit like, him. Yeah, outwit him, that's the word. Yeah. And the constant feels like an analog to that. Yeah. Um, has a lot of those qualities yeah, yeah. Um, the crazy thing too is that i feel like the constant uh, arthur arthur edwards he had multiple opportunities to take out 47 if he really wanted to and he mm -hmm. never did he he always had like that ulterior motive of like no i can make this work for me i can i can convince agent 47 to be the machine that he was created to be and mm -hmm. just be a, yeah. a, a valid uh tool for me going forward and I love that about his character. So he's so complex and, it, and that was very well put because out of all the villains that we've had or, or 47 has really had to partake with, I feel like he has definitely brought uh, a, a lot of depth to 47 in relation to his origins, what happened with his upbringing. There's so much uh, rich history there now moving forward that for I, I think forever the constant or Arthur Edwards will always be remembered as one of the biggest and bestest villains that Agent 47 has ever had to take down. And uh, that ending with, with the serum was perfect because it, it's true. He, he was not scared of dying. As he said, he's like, at least I'll know who I am, like, mm. unlike you, to 47. So he's even taunting him right before his death. He's just yeah. like, you're going to take me out, but at least I know who I am. Yeah. And it's... it's it's so uh, poetic, like poetic justice for for forty seven to just wipe his memory and be like, all right, we'll live the rest of your life like that. Mm. <laughs> I'm convinced that's the canon ending. <laughs> yes, I think so. Yeah, that's too, too for poetic. Sure. Yeah, and I I absolutely also love the mano a mano that the constant has with Diana. I just yeah, I, I feel like as you say, he only ever saw forty seven as like an instrument to. Mm achieve his own you know motives whereas diana was like always 47's puppet master as his handler and mm -hmm. although although 47 is the one that conducts the mission seamlessly it's often diana yeah. that kind of helps him orchestrate it at least in the background giving him intel and um just yeah just having that kind of almost maternal presence you know kind of like his guardian angel mm. looking, looking looking over him and i think arthur edwards recognized that and kind of saw that if he could crack diana by enticing her to become the next constant and 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 enable her to um inherit that power that can be wielded in that coveted position um he he would have no trouble in controlling 47 and and yes. getting him to do anything he wanted um he was i think his downfall was that he was blinded by assuming that his own ideals and interests were the like apex of ideals and interests that anyone could hold yeah and the fact yeah. that other people can have different that ways of viewing the world and worldviews that yeah that was his downfall he thought yeah. he was the smartest yeah and that's actually like a really interesting um what's the word there is a word for it. Um, allegory, I think. Allegory is like the hidden meaning behind a story. And 
Yeah. Um, he, I mean, 47 even says at the very end when he does that little smile, he's like, yeah. um, there'll always be people like them and there'll always be people like us or something like that. Yeah. As in, it's a, the yeah, fight exactly. will always go on, you know? Yeah. But we'll always yeah. have to uh, be there to defend our own values in the world. Yeah. Hence why they choose that the path they choose. Yeah. So we'll see yeah. how that plays out in the future. Yeah, yeah. I put up a poll. To, I think it's going to be a while. I put up a poll today on Twitter to see what people thought about the length of time. Mm. We'll have to wait for another hit. I voted game. in that. Apparently, oh, when I voted, it was at uh, there were seven votes, and it was one hundred percent said five to seven years away. So yeah, everyone seems yeah. to think it's quite a while off. Yeah, um, I think so that's realistically because honestly, I think their eggs are so in the 007 field right yeah. now that. I don't, and if if they return with another Hitman installment, I think it'll be on a different engine because yeah. by that yeah. point we will more than likely be preparing for the next generation of consoles. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, weird to think of it. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Uh, it it just it's so crazy how long it really takes to make a great game. As yeah. you guys can see, this trilogy came out of what five years. So, yeah. and it's honestly, it's five years, years, but like in development, maybe like seven, seven. Probably I think they started. I think they started in 2013 to 2014. Mm. So yeah, okay. seven, seven, eight years. Yeah. Quite this, yeah. So this is this has been like a golden era of Hitman. Like, I think. Oh yeah. New games. Like I think with, when the franchise first started, there was obviously a relatively consistent uh, release of, of titles. Like every couple of years, a new game would come out. Um, but then we had those huge gaps. Between, we had the six year gap between absolute blood money and absolution and then another five year gap four year gap so mm. i suppose we're long overdue for a bit of a hiatus and i think a hiatus will allow the, the ideas to settle and then new ideas will spring forth because yeah. new people want to come with company new designers yeah new writers so we'll get new concepts in the next hitman game yeah. whatever that comes yeah. yeah, but I'm looking forward to 007 in the meantime. Oh yeah, have you started watching the, odd... the Have you started have... watching the odd 007 flick? To... <laughs> I didn't. My local cinema was showing all the old 007 films, so I'm gonna hope. I'm hoping to catch one of them in uh, soon. So I'm gonna start yeah, watching nice. a few of them to get prepared. Yeah. <laughs> nice. However long it takes for another Hitman game to come out, we'll, we'll have to see if we can sustain the podcast. <laughs> yes, let's keep going. <laughs> Keep it chugging along for another seven years. <laughs> yeah. oh my we won't run out of things to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, speaking of thing, running out of things to talk about, I think we've pretty much uh, reached the end of this episode of yeah. Man Hideout. So um, I feel like there's a lot more going to the story. So yeah, we may have to have you back, Xavier, one day. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. And yeah, I'll. I'm down. Anytime you guys want to talk more lore, I'm, I'm here. So. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Be cool to see hear your insights on other aspects of the game as well, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, you guys as well. Thanks again so much for coming on, and uh, thank you everyone for watching. If you've made it this far, this has been a long one. Uh, not that that's a bad thing. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, thank you if you've made it this far. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. But I think we've had a lot to talk about this episode. Um, the the lore and the storytelling side of things is not something you can just, you know, pa <laughs> pass over fleetingly. There's a, there's a lot no, to it's cover. not it's not easy to explain away quickly. It's a very no. complex, deep lore and story. So, no. yeah. Anyway, um, don't forget to leave some feedback in the comments, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll speak to you next time. Yeah, catch you soon.